So now we come to a wonderful scientific tool that's being used currently to tell us so much more about the past, occasionally disappointing us on our ancestral results. <laughs> and that is uh, DNA studies. Can DNA or has DNA told us anything about the Philistines? So that's a great question. Um, and I'll let me give a little introduction. First, of all, one of the big questions about um, Philistine material culture in general um, is how and where did they bury uh, themselves? And up until quite recently, um, there were no clearly identified Philistine cemeteries. Um, I always used to tell my students, there's one thing that we can be sure of is that the Philistine died. Uh, <laughs> we don't know where though. Uh, um, but recently at Tel Asafigat, we have a cemetery in which we excavated one two at Ashkelon, they excavated a cemetery from the second half, from the Iron Age, not from the Iron One, but from the Iron Two, uh, and they excavated uh, scores of tombs. Uh, and there's another cemetery which is excavated near a site of Tel Irani, which might be Philistine. And we have a, an earlier excavated um, cemetery at a place called Azor, which is not necessarily a Philistine city, but it's within the region that we would call Philistia. Now, only recently have we started doing advanced um, scientific techniques and analyses on the archaeological remains, um, which, by the way, is, is something which I'm sure any, any archaeologist that you speak to nowadays, uh, one of the big revolutions of modern archaeology is this astounding toolkit of um, methods that, you know, in the last 10, 20 years have become available and, and you know, and, and we can utilize them. You know, I like saying the difference between what I studied as an archaeologist in the early 1980s and what I can do now and teach my students is sort of like the difference between 19th century medicine and 20th century medicine or 21st century medicine. It's we have the same objectives, but a completely different toolkit and all kinds of things that we're completely in, in the dark about we now have access to. So when we talk about um, uh, Philistine cemeteries, by the way, it's not only DNA. We now have, uh, for example, DNA in isotope studies and more advanced physical anthropology, which all give us um, uh, a lot more information on the health, um, which, by the way, uh, most of the tombs that we excavate of, uh, of Philistines, but of ancient uh, peoples in general, show us very clearly that one, they died at a younger age, at a substantially younger age than, than, they, than, than we live today. And most of them um, uh, had bad teeth and arthritis and all kinds of uh, diseases that, that they lived through. And this concept that, you know, so many people have is, you know, just go back to, you know, ancient ways of life and everything will be great, you know, do it, but you'll die at 40 with uh, aches and pains <laughs> throughout your life. So, so it's, uh, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a myth that's it's important to dispel because there's this like image of, oh, just go back from modern times and, and 5G, which is causing all this horrible stuff, and we'll all be fine, you know, that's, that's new. Anyway, so, um, so um, from the initial uh, DNA analysis, both those in publish and those are in progress, and I can't talk very much about those in progress, but we even have some more cool results for those in progress. But those have been published, show us that the population from a genetic point of view in Philistia is a uh, complex, um, multi-origin uh, group. It's not uh, a monolithic group that came from one place and settled, but it seems to be um, a mixture of various people together in a mishmash. Uh, and I think the more we excavate, we more we analyze and more we publish both the isotopic uh, analysis and the DNA, we're going to get more and more of that. And it's, um, it's a very important aspect. And again, that's only one, the origins is only one other, one aspect. It's what they ate, um, what their health was, um, you know, what, you know, for example, using DNA, one of the things that we show is that the pigs um, that we find in Lystia and in the land of Israel during antiquity, um, probably when the Philistines arrived, they brought with them pigs from Greece or from Southeastern Europe. And these pigs 
escape. And, and nowadays, the wild wars in Israel, from a genetic point of view, are closer to uh, wars in southeastern Europe than they are from boars, wild pigs in, not the boars, B-O-R-E-S, but, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, uh, from boar in uh, northern Syria and in Turkey. And that's probably because when the Philistines came, they brought with them squealing pigs on their ships. And that fits in, by the way, um, it's very common that um, people in ships bring along pigs for the simple reason is that a pig can um, eat all the garbage and sewage that's produced by the sailors. And in the end, you eat them. Um, so it's, it's a walking uh, calorie bank, which also serves as a, um, you know, a sort of like a vacuum cleaner. So it's, uh, it's, it makes sense that they would have, bring them, have brought them along. Um, and this goes for all kinds of other things. For example, um, study of, of the plant remains shows us that they're, they come from a, a very, very um, uh, complex and multifaceted origins, and it's not something coming from one area. Very interesting. And that actually answers a question Morrow had asked, and that was if the high number of pig bones found at Philistine sites could tell us anything about the Philistines. One of the things that we see very clearly is that um, with the appearance of the Philistine culture, there's a change in the diet and uh, even the, let's say, agronomical practices um, in the region. And one of the things we see, for example, is that there's a rise in um, consumption of pig bone and also dog meat. We see both pig bones and dog uh, bones with cut marks, clearly showing that they're being e eaten. Um, at the same time, we see that there's new types of uh, plants which are brought to the land at the time. And the first utilization of local plants would in previous had not been uh, utilized. And, and also indications that there were change in methods of agriculture because new, new types of plants are, are, appear. So that's one thing. Now, the other thing is, it's been very often stated in the past that a, a very good way to differentiate between the Philistines, on the one hand, and the Israelites, Judites, and the Canaanites at that time was who ate pig bones. And a, supposedly, um, abstention or a taboo on, the, uh, on eating pig was a very, very clear way of, of saying who, who, who was a Philistine, who was not. Now, um, that's really nice. It's to a certain extent based on um, extrapolating, extrapolating to later periods in which when Jews did not eat pig till today and, and, and traditional Jewish um, uh, culinary customs, you're not allowed to eat pig. And uh, it was thought that this was, goes back way then. Now, the problem is, is that at some Philistine sites, they do eat pig. At some, they don't. At some... Judite sites that don't eat pig. It's some Israel sites they did they do. So it's more complex than just yes no. Um, but that in general goes to the question of identity, and that was one of the topics that we wanted to uh, broach. Is you know how do you deal with identity based on archaeological remains? And that's one of the most complex issues in archaeology, and it's it's a very often um, even with theoretically oriented archaeologists who are aware of the complexity, it's so, it's so comfortable and easy, cozy to get back to very simplistic uh, definitions of one, two, three, or four, we put them in a box and that's it. Really, from an archaeological point of view, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to differentiate between uh, various groups, to even assume that, you, that the archaeological record can do that. And to assume that there's only one type of identity, you know, just like nowadays, we all have six, seven identities simultaneously running and, and we overlap differently with different people in different groups. The same thing goes for the past. You know, for some reason, archaeologists and historians very often emphasize ethnic identity, uh, but that's only one of the types of identities. And then the big question is, um, can the archaeological remains actually tell us and do the presence or absence of this or that find a certain type of house, a certain type of bone, et cetera, et cetera, does that tell us um, really black and white? And probably, you know, it's, it's you know, like, like life in general, things were not black or white. There, were, there was a lot of gray in between. Uh, and, um, and the gray is, is hard to differentiate. And, and one of the, for example, one of, the, one of the, the best ways to differentiate people is not by the presence absence, but, for example, by 
their practice, communities of practice, what they did. And, and, and it's not always that simple to get that information from the archaeological remains. So, you know, I, I, if we're going back to going, touching on identity, it's very convenient to try to name these different groups and say, oh, Goth is a Philistine site, Jerusalem is a, is, is a Judite site, etc. But once you start moving to the, you know, closer to the border between these uh, these entities, a lot of things are fuzzy, and it's it's much harder to define who's who, you know. And I think that's a big one. For example, the pig bones that connects to that issue. 